This is my electrically controlled potato cannon, which actually has almost nothing to do with a potato cannon. It reloads fully automatically, injects butane gas and fires mighty explosive arrows. I've received a lot of comments and messages asking for a more detailed video, so here it is. In my youth, I love playing with potato cannons. The power you can unleash with such simple means always fascinated me. But the effort for each shot was annoying. Especially the misfires. And reloading. You have to punch out the potatoes and push them into the barrel with a rod. Also annoying. And honestly, there are much cooler things to shoot than potatoes. But we'll get to that later. For one of these things to work, you need a combustible mixture. A flammable gas like butane and oxygen. Simply spraying in gas isn't enough. Fresh air also needs to get into the combustion chamber. And you need the perfect mixing ratio. With 3.2% butane, theoretically all the butane and all the oxygen burn up. This is called the stoichiometric ratio. A bit more butane gives more power, less butane is more efficient. But of course we are interested in maximum power. The problem is, when you inject the gas by hand, you have almost no control. You need a butane percentage between 1.8 and 8.4% to even get an explosion. It's a wide range, but still hard to hit. I'm all about things that are compact and efficient. Classic potato cannons are way too bulky for me. That had to change with my new design. So what was the plan? To build an automatic mini potato cannon that doesn't even shoot potatoes. Now I'll show you the challenges I faced, what features this thing has and what it can do. To fully automate a potato cannon, it takes more steps than you might think at the first glance. First a new shot has to be loaded into the barrel. Now the gas comes into play. Injecting the right amount is tricky, because without precision there's no power. After injecting, air and gas needs to be mixed well. Luckily this part is less complicated, but it ensures an even puff. Now it's time for action. The gas mixture is ignited. The real moment of truth. After the shot, the oxygen in the combustion chamber is used up. Fresh air must be let into before the next shot. Each of these steps is crucial for the cannon to work reliably. And of course to make sure there's plenty of punch at the end. The project can be divided into three disciplines. Mechanics, which involves not only the moving parts for reloading the arrows, but also the arrangement of all the components and the design of the casing. Since everything needed to be nice and compact, this was a real challenge. I printed all the housing parts on my SLS printer using PA12. Compared to FDM printers, it gives amazing surface quality, high strength and I didn't have to worry about orientation or overhangs when designing. Then we have the electronics. I needed a control system that analyzes various sensors and controls motors, fans, valves and the display. And of course there needs to be software that turns all the theory into practice. Each area has its own challenges, but together they make the project truly exciting. For the reloading mechanism I chose an electric slider. I then inserted a short piece of another pipe into the barrel, which fits precisely into the barrel. The slider first pushes it backwards until the barrel is fully opened at the bottom. For this I milled out one side of the barrel. Then an arrow slides from the magazine into place. When the inner pipe moves back, it pushes the arrow forward and closes the barrel at the bottom again. Since the inner pipe is hollow, it lets the explosion pressure pass through from behind to accelerate the arrow. The end positions are detected by two limit switches. To prevent the arrow from slipping out forward, I installed a spring-loaded ball plunger that slightly clamps the arrow. These things are handy for many applications. 
I usually like to use them in joints to achieve a satisfying snap into the final position. The magazine looks simple, but in detail it turned out to be a bit tricky. An unexpected big challenge was finding a suitable compression spring that reliably pushes the arrows upwards. At one point I even tried to wind a spring myself using a 3D printed jig. It was important that the arrows are only pushed out when the magazine is correctly inserted. Two catch hooks normally hold the arrows at the bottom. When inserting the magazine, two angled planes push the catch hooks apart, releasing the arrows. The key is that the arrows don't fall out suddenly when pulling the magazine out. The catch hooks need to grab again in time. Additionally, I integrated a button that detects whether the magazine is inserted. It's not strictly necessary, but this way I could program a counter that displays how many shots are left in the magazine. Injecting the gas was by far the biggest challenge. I opted for these small refillable lightest gas bottles. They are compact, readily available and sufficient for many shots. The most important component for injecting is the solenoid valve. After a long search I chose a fuel valve from automotive technology. These valves are durable, affordable and perfect for this application. But how long should the valve stay open to inject the right amount of gas? The answer? It depends. At higher ambient temperatures, the pressure in the bottle rises and more gas is injected in the same amount of time. The fill level of the bottle also plays a role. Paradoxically, more gas is injected the emptier the bottle gets. This is because the liquid gas does not evaporate very quickly. When the bottle is empty, a larger cavity is created where evaporated gas can accumulate and build up pressure. This evaporated gas is injected when the valve opens and the pressure drops, so initially much more gas is injected than a few milliseconds later. If the bottle is very full, the cavity is smaller and the pressure drops much faster. So a fixed injection time was not an option. Flow sensors were also ruled out because small flow sensors typically work by cooling. The surface inside is electrically heated up and when the medium flows past, the surface cools down. This temperature change allows the flow speed of the medium to be inferred. However, there's a problem when using gas. The gas cools during evaporation process. Therefore, the gas is much colder during the second shot than during the first, which would distort the measurement. I figured calculating and compensating this numerically would be difficult. My solution was the pressure sensor. This allows me to measure the pressure in the bottle and calculate how much gas is escaping through the valve per second. For calibration, I did measurements with an adjustable compressor. Using an inverted measurement cylinder filled with water, I could accurately determine the gas amount at different pressures. From the data, I created a graph and derived a formula that I integrated into the software. Since the pressure immediately drops when the valve opens, I divide the time into millisecond intervals. Every millisecond I measure the pressure, calculate the gas amount for this short interval and sum up the values. As soon as the desired amount is reached, the valve closes. Another challenge was creating a gas-tight connection between the gas bottle, the sensor and the valve. The connectors are completely different and no suitable adapters exist. Additionally, the design had to be as compact as possible. My solution? I used a resin 3D printer to create a custom channel into which the sensor and the valve are inserted and sealed with silicon. For the bottle, I built a mechanism that clamps it in place. An o-ring with some grease ensures everything stays reliably sealed and the bottle is easily replaceable. One small limitation is that I can't hold the bottle upside down while injecting. Otherwise liquid gas would be injected, which evaporates after injecting in the combustion chamber. The gas amount would end up being much higher. This is the same as holding a Bunsen burner upside down. I've been searching for a membrane or a filter that only lets gaseous gas through but blocks liquid gas. So far I haven't found anything. 
please let me know in the comments if you know a compact solution. After the gas is injected, it should be thoroughly mixed with the air in the combustion chamber for optimal chemical reaction. For this I repurposed a small fan from a miniature helicopter. The mixing duration can be adjusted flexibly. As with all parameters, I've programmed a developer menu for this. This allows me to make adjustments directly without having to connect the PC and modify the source code every time. It saves time and makes the system much more maintenance friendly. Ok, now we're ready to ignite. But how? I wanted to make sure there wouldn't be any electromagnetic interference caused by a piezo element from a lighter which is often used in potato cannons. After all, I didn't want my electronics to restart or burn out due to voltage spikes when the ignition spark is triggered. Other high voltage generators were also out of the question for this reason. I know that such interference can be managed, but I didn't want to deal with electromagnetic compatibility issues unnecessarily. So I opted for tungsten filament. A MOSFET switches the powerful power tool lithium ion cells directly to the filament for a few milliseconds, causing it to glow immediately and ignite the gas mixture. In my tests, 15 milliseconds were enough to ignite reliably. And it can take much longer or the filament will burn out. That's why I chose tungsten, as it has the highest melting point of all metals, just like in old light bulbs. As mentioned before, we can't just reload and inject new gas right away because the oxygen has already burned. That's why I installed a large valve flap at the back. After each shot, it's opened by an electromagnet and the blower pumps fresh air into the combustion chamber from behind, while the spent air can escape through the barrel. This process takes 2-3 to three seconds and then we are ready to start all over again. To control all the components, the linear motor, the fans, etc. and read the pressure sensors and the buttons, I of course needed a controller. For this project I decided to use a ready-made Raspberry Pi Pico, which I programmed in MicroPython. However, I also had to design my own PCB, primarily containing various MOSFETs to amplify the outputs of the Pi Pico, since the motors and especially the ignition glow wire require higher currents. Additionally, two voltage regulators were needed to generate 5 volts and 12 volts from the battery voltage. The layouts for such regulators aren't trivial, and since I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, I used off the shelf components. For completeness, I should also mention the charging regulator in the handle, which allows me to charge the two batteries via USB C. I found a ready made PCB for that as well. However, I made a mistake with the design. I had originally planned for each individual component to have a connector. In total there are 13. But in the design of the case I didn't account for space for the mating connectors. <clears throat> so I quickly decided to solder all the wires directly onto the board. Unfortunately it doesn't look great, but it's the most space efficient option. And still it was a challenge to fit all the wires in, even though I should know better by now. I constantly underestimate the space required for wiring in every single project. Once I was finally done, I was incredibly curious to see how fast the cannon would shoot and how high the projectile energy would be. First I built a ballistic pendulum. A bullet is shot into the pendulum filled with modeling clay. A plastic collusion occurs. By using the conversation of momentum, the formula for potential energy and the angle at which the pendulum swings, the projectile energy can be calculated. Wikipedia has everything explained in detail. However, there was a problem. The outflowing gas caused the pendulum to swing significantly even without the projectile. I had added a separator, but it didn't help. I would have needed to position it much far away. But before spending too much time aligning the pendulum, I discovered that you can also buy a chronograph cheaply to measure the projectile speed much more easily.
With a heavy steel ball I reached up to 143 FPS, which corresponds to about 4 joules. The energy was in the expected range, but I was still somehow unsatisfied with the speed, so I printed a few plastic balls. With these I reached 237 FPS, which with their lower mass still results in a lower energy of only 1.6 joules. So we are in the range of better airsoft guns. But I wasn't satisfied with that yet, so I tested different barrel lengths. The short 26cm barrel looks the best, but with a 61cm barrel I reached 223 FPS or 9.4 joules with steel balls and 412 FPS or 4.9 joules with plastic balls. With a 1 meter barrel the gun looks even stranger but I got even higher values. 252 FPS with steel balls and 610 FPS with plastic ones. The highest energy I measured was 12.1 joules. What's interesting is that the energy gap between steel and plastic gets smaller when the barrel length increases. If anyone has a theory on why that happens, I'd be curious to see a discussion in the comments. And to this point I wasn't even close to being finished. Just shooting simple balls would be boring. I've done hundreds of tests with arrows, whistling arrows, glowing arrows, self-igniting arrows and explosive arrows. But that deserves its own video. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss it.